Hey everyone, today we're going to be looking at a, an interesting cooler. This is the Patriotic Cooler. That's, that's the name of it. We'll get to that in a moment. And it's very strange. It's circular. When you disassemble it and sort of pull it apart, there's a fan that's inside of this chamber, but it's, it's an odd fan. It looks and behaves more like a propeller than anything else. So we'll be taking it apart. We have full thermal numbers. We've got pressure testing, all the usual stuff that we do for our cooler reviews. It's something a little bit unique and maybe makes sense for a kiosk build that demands attention, but thermally, well, you'll see. But we're gonna look at this cooler today. It's fun, it's different. We got it for $28 from AliExpress. Uh, and frankly, that was probably too much. So let's get started to, to try and make some of that back. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermaltake and the Thermaltake Tough Ram XG memory. Thermaltake's Tough Ram XG series is a freshly updated line of RGB memory available in frequencies ranging from 3600 megahertz up to 4600 megahertz. Thermaltake's Tough Ram XG uses 10 layer PCBs and heat spreaders affixed with bright LEDs everywhere. And they market toward overclocking support and capabilities. Learn more at the links in the description below. Originally when we saw the photos for this cooler, and we've got some B-roll of it turned on and everything, we'll put it on the screen, but saw the photos, we weren't quite clear on what it was. It looked like it could maybe be a thermo or piezoelectric cooler of some kind from the shape. It looked like it could maybe be a very bizarrely shaped open loop CPU block. It was none of those. It's just an air cooler. It's very simple. It's got some heat pipes, a cold plate, a fin stack, and airflow by way of a fan, and that's all it is. So it ends up just looking kind of weird and different, and sometimes there's an appeal to that. Uh, oftentimes, performance falls by the wayside as a result, but we don't begrudge companies for trying to do something different, especially in a space like CPU coolers or cases where it's so difficult to do anything different. So uh, this thing is, here's the box for it. This thing, as we said, we bought it from AliExpress. We checked, it is on Amazon. It seems to be about $30 there as well. We're going to be testing it versus the stock AMD coolers, the Noctua NH-U12S Redux, the $50 cooler. So you'll have a pretty full range of, of tests if you do actually want to buy one. So the name of the cooler in English is Igo Shadow Max. Uh, this is the, that says Dying, which is just shadow. Uh, it's the V5. Apparently there have been four versions of this before. Uh, that's either a very good or a very bad design, depending on why there are revisions. It's the max version, apparently, so that's also good. Fan goes up to 3,000 RPM, pretty high. The name of it uh, here, it says, well, we translated it, but uh, the name Igwo is just patriotic. So I, I guess patriotic Shadow Max V5 is the name of the cooler. Pretty much everything Intel. So 1155 is on the support list. It's 115X. AMD goes up to AMP4, so that's supported. So it's been modernized. Okay, time to look at the Igo cooler. So this is uh, pretty easy to take apart. The top cap can rotate. First off, it's by design to remove it, and you pop it off. It's got four notches in it, so it can be rotated if you wanted to orient it a certain way on your CPU. We'll look at if this thing's actually any good in a moment. We'll get there, but from a mechanical perspective, They've done well to actually account for one of the most common failings in coolers like this, where you, people can't orient the logo the way they want. So that's pretty forward looking, actually. If we look further in the Igo cooler, you can see internally there's a bunch of LEDs. So there's a ring of LEDs around the outside. Uh, the heat pipes, of course, showing through at this point, so we know where those terminate now. Unfortunately, they terminate inside of a plastic cavity that's completely enclosed. As a reminder, this is the evaporator end of a heat pipe. There's a little bit of liquid in there. It's about one drop, almost literally. It evaporates down here. Uh, it rises as a gas up to the top, and then it recondenses into a liquid, so you get the phase change to help with dissipation. It's all standard stuff, but it's trapped. So unfortunately, there's some efficiency loss there. We do get to the hot glue extremely early in the disassembly. There it is for everyone to see. There's a, a nice blob of hot glue that looks like they maybe applied it like this and then let it drip down as it dried. So great attention to detail there. I like the little extra strains of glue that are still attached and just kind of free form. It's, it's very artistic. The, the hot glue is a nice touch. It does terminate in power and control for the LEDs. That's what that is. And other than that, pretty simple. We've got some screws. So let's take those out quickly and show you the other side of it. 
Okay, we have freed the top plate. It's actually pretty heavy, and that's because the fan is attached. So, uh, pretty simple design. Let's start with the fact that there's a gaping hole in the cooler. Looks interesting. It's, it's pretty unique. We've seen stuff like this. Uh, if you had any of the old Zalman coolers, you might remember they were oriented basically like this, except with the heat pipe, uh, the cold plate down at the bottom. So you get like this flower, almost floral design from Zalman's old stuff. And the cables go down this channel here. So we're gonna just take those out now to decouple these. It's about the size of one of these. There's your AMD stock cooler, one of them. So we've taken the entire space that you could normally use for a fan and have replaced it with plastic. Uh, not necessarily a bad thing, depending on how it's executed, but we get the benefit here of more surface area. So, well, at least vertically. It's hard to account for the hole in the middle. I, uh, that math gets kind of complex, but uh, at least looks like more surface area. When the socket's into it, we tested it out by powering this and checking for airflow around the outsides. You can do this with an anemometer or something as simple as a hand. And what it does is uh, sockets in like that, and the air mostly gets movement down here below it. And so what that's gonna do is push the air down and out, almost at an angle. Probably if these fins were oriented a little differently, it would be optimal. But the air ends up largely concentrated in this area down here. So you're getting good cooling on the heat pipes, which is valuable. Uh, and you're getting a lot of concentrated air on this Maybe it's easier to see this way. So you're getting a lot of concentrated air down here on this thing where there's a small fin stack. This is not uh, new. Companies have done this a lot. Be Quiet has done this a lot. But adds a little bit of extra surface area right on top of the cold plate. Sometimes it's a gimmick. Sometimes it's useful. In this instance, there's airflow directly contacting it because most of the air is coming straight down. So that's pretty much all there is to it in terms of construction, mechanical qualities. This is a four-pole motor. You can always tell by just push it around until you feel magnetic engagement, until it makes a full circle, and that's four. So we've got four magnetic poles in there. That's pretty standard for a fan. And then for the rest, the heat pipes, there's five of them. They are six mil heat pipes. Yes, they're six mil heat pipes. So I'm, I'm one for one now on using metric today. Uh, so six mil heat pipes. The cold plate, uh, we'll do a pressure test of and, and get a better idea for the engagement across the surface. That's gonna be big with anything where you have direct contact because they have to do a, an excellent job of smoothing that out to make it work well. And then also the mounting hardware comes into play there as well. So that's the mechanics of the Shadow Max, the Dieying cooler. It's, it, like I said, it's 28 bucks. We're gonna see how it does in testing. Maybe a replacement for a stock cooler. Obviously a small tower, like maybe even a Hyper 212, which isn't that great, but uh, you get more service area, bigger fan, it'll run quieter at a given temperature. A, a tower like that, a more standard one, will be thermally better in almost every scenario, unless exceptionally poorly designed. But this one's trying to be unique. We can't fault them for that. That's something we've wanted a lot. So as long as everyone knows how the performance is and it's not completely terrible, maybe it's okay. But let's get started. We'll look at some of the uh, pressure mounting and thermals and acoustics for this one. Up first is our pressure map. As always, a huge thanks to those of you who have bought from store.gamersnexus.net for making it possible to buy our expensive pressure mapping and NIST traceable equipment. We're almost sold out of our popular wireframe mouse mats, so if you'd like a quality mouse mat or pad and want to support GN, visit store.gamersnexus.net to grab one and help us with content like this. Back to the pressure map. This is done with the CPU inactive. So the CPU doesn't actually matter other than to provide us with an IHS. The 3950X mount has a massive gap centrally, which is where the dies are, and there's some coverage around the perimeter. This is easily the worst pressure map we have ever seen of a cooler. There's nothing that even comes close to this level of bad. Thermal paste will make up for it, and it does make contact when there's paste there, but the pressure is so minimal centrally that there's a lot of performance left on the table for this cooler. Looking at the 3800X, it's more of the same. There's a huge gap in coverage centrally. The points closest to the mount have some pressure picking up on the scan, but nowhere else does, and the pressure that does pick up isn't even that much. Even the perimeter pressure is just, it's insufficient here. The end result is that iGo's mounting hardware needs a lot of work to fix these shortcomings. Time to look at installation to understand that pressure map. For AMD, two brackets are installed to the underside of the cooler with two screws on each side. 
the end of each bracket has relatively wide hole spacing for the screws, which can be problematic for security since there's enough wiggle room to shift the screw by maybe a millimeter or so. Frustratingly, the included AM4 backplate is not to be used for this cooler. Andy's backplate is actually pretty well built. It's all metal, it's structurally fine. There's not really a reason not to use it. It's just a piece of metal anyway. So it's a waste of material to make a replacement. Instead, Igo wants you to use the flimsy plastic backplate that supports both AMD and Intel that they provide. This may be part of the pressure problem as well, but otherwise, this is kind of familiar to an older style of installing heat sinks. Four standoffs get installed with specific holes in the backplate, as again is an old and now mostly retired style, and then they're secured with plastic clips. We're up to nine pieces of hardware just to get this far, plus four for the earlier screws and two for the earlier brackets. That's 15 pieces of hardware already. Making matters less reassuring, the standoffs have wiggle room in the motherboard screw holes, allowing for more room for the user to execute a bad mount. The cooler can now be seated on the CPU and threads tightened in a usual diagonal pattern. From here, it's all standard. The cables can be connected for RGB LEDs and fan control and you're done. Intel follows the same process, except it uses different brackets adjacent to the cold plate, and yellow clips are used to hold the screws in place in the back plate instead. Otherwise, the rest is the same as the AMD process. Historically, most of our cooler testing has been oriented around a 125 watt and a 200 watt heat load. We only recently added 65 watt testing for lower end CPUs, lower end coolers, like an R5, relative at least to the high end stuff. So the chart is still getting populated and it's a bit sparse right now. It'll take a few months to build out a dense chart like we have for the others. We do, however, have enough here to start. The iGo Shadow Max ended up at 48 degrees Celsius over ambient in the R5 heat load, meaning it's actually not bad. It's surprisingly okay, probably more so than it deserves from that pressure map and the surface area helps make up for a lot of the downsides, but it's doing okay. The Shadow Max ended up within margin of error of the Wraith Prism cooler we tested, both at the same noise level, of course, for this, and actually better than the AMD Wraith Spire at 35 dBA for both. Obviously, it's not worth spending $30 to get the same performance as an included Wraith Prism, or a 4 degree improvement over a Wraith Spire. A small tower as well, like the NHU-12S Redux, yields significant gains over all of these options. We'll soon add a $30 tower cooler to testing as well, so check back for that in the next one. Thus far though, in the noise normalized 35 dBA testing, it's not terrible. So that's actually a good start from something that looked like it was form over function. At 100% fan speed, the iGo Shadow Max ended up at 43.4 dBA when measured with standardized methodology at 20 inches distant. That has it noticeably quieter than a maxed out Wraith Prism, louder than a maxed out Wraith Spire, and significantly louder than the Scythe Fuma 2. For cooling, all that extra noise didn't amount to much power. It only shed about four degrees from the previous test, in Celsius of course, and it ended up only better than a passively cooled solution and the quieter Spire stock solution. The Wraith Spire solution was stuck at 51 degrees over ambient, so there's a bit of gap here. The Shadow Max is thus far definitely inefficient, but it is working, so that's something. The last chart in this very simple review by our standards will be for VRM thermals. We cut the 125 and 200 watt heat loads for this cooler since they're just they're going to be too much for it. But VRM thermals on the R5 will be interesting given the downdraft flow. The AMD Wraith Spire has the best VRM thermals thus far in this limited testing and that's because it's downdraft. It's not the best cooler, let's get that clear. But pushing air down and out towards the MOSFETs clearly has some benefits. The Prism is next and then the Redux, which is benefited by its larger fan and a wider area spray of air. After this is the Igo Shadow, and despite the downward flow on the Igo, air isn't spraying at the right arc to hit the VRM as effectively as the AMD stock coolers. Ultimately, however, all of these thermals are well, well within spec. We're not even close to a problem, so functionally, it's irrelevant and there won't ever be any meaningful impact to the life on this board's VRM if you were to use one versus the other. It might matter on an extremely low end motherboard, but we couldn't quickly think of one where the Igwo's difference in the relatively higher reading would be life and death for a lower end board as compared to the other coolers on this chart. Additionally, at some point, it becomes the motherboard's problem anyway. So it's fine. This is mostly just useful because it tells us about the flow pattern, which is less outward than we initially thought. So the cooler and the conclusion is really pretty simple at the end of the day. It's not terrible. It did a lot better than we expected it to do. And it's, it's not really worth buying at $30. There's a lot of better coolers out there. 
especially something that's a proper tower at the cheap. So this isn't a value purchase. Uh, it is not a price to performance purchase either, but it maybe makes sense if you want something really unique that is at least capable of running a system without thermal throttling if it's a lower power CPU. Like, again, an i5, an R5, something below the 70, 80 watt area, it'll do okay. It'll do better than the stock cooler from Intel. It does about as well in sort of the best case scenario as some of AMD's stock coolers when they're noise normalized. And that's about the most you can ask for out of this thing. So it's not terrible. Uh, we wouldn't recommend buying it. There's sort of a, it's just, it's not good value. It's got some mounting pressure issues. It has many inefficiencies in the hardware and the installation. So it's, it doesn't get a recommendation from us, but it does get a, if you have a specific personal use case where you want to use it, maybe you want to mod it and do something cool with the top cover plate, you could probably pretty easily pop, actually you could very easily remove the logo they have here if you wanted to maybe 3D print your own or something like that, or laser cut your own. Uh, you could do that. Maybe there's a use there where it's interesting for modders, it's interesting for someone who's trying to build something that looks unique but isn't necessarily good. And that's about kind of the end of it for this one. We did some research on the company. They've been around actually a long time. From what we can understand, it looks like Igo or, or Igo and Dark Flash are either sibling companies or Dark Flash may own Igo. We're going to go with the American pronunciation here for ease, but uh, may own them. They have a parent company, at least one. There might be another above that. Did some digging through it. Uh, the companies do have experience manufacturing this stuff. Dark Flash, you may have seen on Newegg and Amazon, more of sort of bargain bin priced components, but that's where they decided to start. There's nothing really wrong with that. Uh, so they've been around, they have some experience. It appears to be mostly a legitimate real company. Uh, so if you haven't heard of it, that doesn't mean they haven't been around, but it does appear like Igo here is trying to get into a Western market with something that's a bit unique. They had a lot of other coolers as well, including standard towers. We probably won't test those, but maybe if there's enough interest, we will. But otherwise, at about $28, $30, there are absolutely better things than, than the Shadow Max, as it's called in the West. So that's it for this one. Thanks for watching. Let us know what you think of the this cooler, the, the Shadow Max V5. We're curious if you want us to look at other coolers that are unique, interesting, weird, and you've seen some, you want to see what we think of them, feel free to point us towards them in the comment section below. YouTube will often filter comments with URLs in them. So if you just type in the name of the product, we'll look it up wherever it may be and, uh, and find it. Maybe that'll give us some fun stuff to look at next. That's not a standard cooler. So thanks for watching. Subscribe for more as always. You can go to store.gamersnexus.net or patreon.com slash gamersnexus if you would like to help us in purchasing more strange coolers. And we'll see you all next time.